Yeah, let's just uh, jump straight into it. This is uh, a presentation about a paper called uh, Illicit Financial Flows and the Global South. Uh, it's a review of method, methods and uh, evidence from the literature. So it might seem a bit redundant trying to explain to, to you guys why it's important to, to look at uh, illicit financial flows. But anyway, uh, tax revenues they, relative to GDP, they remain low in the, the global south relative to uh, more advanced economies. Um, and they are inherently associated with international transactions, which could create this kind of unfair competition and misallocation of resources. So for example, um, an international firm has the opportunity to engage in profit shifting, which domestic firms do not have. That could create an unfair competition. Also, there's a strong overrepresentation of wealthy households engaging in, uh, in um, illicit financial flows, which further increases inequality. So it's not the poor worker on the ground that is uh, sending its, his money to, to Panama, that, are, that is the more wealthy, wealthy people. And then perception about other people evading could also lead to the risk of you evading increasing as well. Um, so just by changing the perception about people evading could actually have real effects. But what is illicit financial flows then? Um, it might seem weird because I think everyone has a sense of what it is. But still, in the, both in the literature and among big organizations, there is not a consensus. So that is uh, stated by Maya Forstater in the following way. If there is already a clear global consensus of the wider definition of illicit financial flows, then it is a well-kept secret. So why is this? Most of it revolves around the word illicit and how we should think of that. Should we equate it with illegal? That is the big question. So just looking at the dictionaries, uh, then it is indeed different. So Oxford Dictionary says it's something that is forbidden by law, rules, or customs. So it's indeed something that is wider than just, um, than just something being illegal. And the same goes for Cambridge Dictionary saying it's illegal or disapproved of by society. So again, a broader definition than just being illegal. The counter argument then is that that customs and what is approved of by society could change both uh, spatially and temporally. So it might differ between countries. So what is seen as what is disapproved of by society in one country is not necessarily disapproved of in another. There's also temporal differences. So what, what we disapprove of today, we might not have disapproved of that 20 years ago. So these customs, they are changing over time and over, over, over places. So a more pragmatic uh, approach is using the legality um, approach here. The second word financial indicates that it is something to do with cash, profits, loans, or, or equities. But that leaves out other assets like real estate and luxury goods. So if you buy um, a big luxury home in Bahamas, there and you don't report that to the tax authorities, that should actually not be seen as illicit financial flows because that is not financial. Um, so it might be more appropriate considering all types of assets. The last one, flows, indicate that it's assets moving from one person or place to another. Um, so here again, it's, it's flows and later when I will talk a bit about hidden wealth in general, then that will be seen as more like accumulated illicit financial flows. All right, so more concretely, everyone agrees that illicit financial flows should, in should include activities that are related to illegal markets. So that could be terrorism, tax evasion, corruption, etc. cetera. Uh, so what is illegal should also be under illicit financial flows. OECD, IMF, and the World Bank, they use this more narrow definition of, of uh, IFFs, but they also acknowledge that there is a discussion uh, on whether to include illicit activities as well. I should stress that this, this presentation is based on, on, the, on this overview paper that came out a year ago, so 
I'm not completely sure whether they have changed practice since then, but uh, at least a year ago they, they had this practice. On the other hand, the European Union, the African Union and the UN, they further acknowledge legal practices as IFF. So that could, for example, be abusive transfer pricing. So even though it's not illegal, it might still be considered uh, illicit financial flows. Where does that then leave us uh, in the paper? I advocate for the broad definition, because if, if we are only to use illegal activities, then why shouldn't we just call it illegal financial flows? Um, so if we want to stick to the, to the concept of illicit financial flows, we should at least acknowledge that there are other activities than just the illegal ones. It might be that we can only measure what is illegal, but we should still acknowledge that there are other flows um, that are also illicit that we cannot measure. I will skip this uh, theoretical framework uh, due to time, as Finhi was kindly mentioning. Uh, all right, so in the paper, I identify four overall um, themes or approaches to studying illicit financial flows. Uh, one is macroeconomic statistics. That is probably the most used approach. Uh, that includes uh, studying balance of payments and uh, also looking into aggregate liabilities and assets. I named that the Sukman method. Uh, so basically, liabilities and assets on a global scale should match. If they do not, then there is something odd going on. Uh, and what we see in the data is that liabilities are usually higher than assets because you always have a an incentive to report your liabilities, but not necessarily your assets. So Sukman, he, uh, he interpreted this gap as, uh, as hidden wealth or misreported uh, wealth. You can also look at firms that are only um, having activities domestically versus multinational firms. Uh, so if firms are more productive in low tax, uh, countries that could be indicative of, of profit shifting going on if we do not see the same for domestic firms. Uh, scholars have also looked into aggregate corporate income tax basis, again, seeing how that differ depending on, on, uh, on the corporate tax rates. And finally, a newer, newer method uh, is called phantom foreign direct investments. So the idea being that some, some foreign direct investments are only going through a country in order to sort of hide its real, real destination. As an example, Luxembourg has a massive income of foreign direct investments. I think at the time of, of this paper, it was four trillion US dollars per year, but they also had outflows of four trillion US dollars per year. That is more or less the same as the United States. A second method is trade misinvoicing. Uh, so as a firm, you have an incentive to, to uh, over-report costs when you are importing uh, materials um, so that you sort of try to bring your cost and, and, uh, and revenues to, uh, to match so that you will have no profits. And that also depends, of course, on the corporate um, tax rate in the country. A third method is looking into intra-firm profit shifting, also highly, um, or it's well studied. Um, so I, again, basically the idea is that when you are a multinational firm, then you have an incentive to shift profits from a high tax environment to a low tax environment. And then there are a fourth more gather all the, all the other approaches, um, which I will get back to. All right, so what do they actually find in the literature? So again, here I should stress that capital flight is not necessarily the same as illicit financial flows. Uh, but capital flight from developing countries ranges from around 150 billion US dollars to 200 billion dollars. This is, these, these numbers are by now a bit old. That was in 2010, 2014, more or less the same. Um, and then Stukman, he has a measure of, of this um, unrecorded wealth. So these, these number, this number of 7.6 trillion US dollars, that, is, that can be seen as accumulated illicit financial flows. Um, so that is this method of comparing liabilities with assets on a global scale. And then he finds that there are 
that we are short of 7.6 trillion US dollars in assets. It is also found in the literature that uh, when you compare uh, domestic firms with, um, with multinational firms, then the multinational firms, they are way more uh, profitable in low tax environments. So we see a clear tendency that multinational enterprises, they are very productive and more profitable in uh, low tax environments, but the same doesn't go for domestic firms. So for domestic firms, it's pretty much flat. Um, Crivelli and Kopam and Jansky, they also try to measure uh, the global tax loss, uh, and they find measures of 500 to 650 billion US dollars per year. Uh, so it's, it's massive numbers that, uh, that, we are, that we are missing out on. This newer method of uh, FDIs, uh, phantom FDIs, says that, or shows that almost 40% of global foreign direct investments, they were not related to any real activity. So they pretty much just went from one country through a transit country and then on to the final destination country. For the, uh, for the profit shifting literature, um, there, is, uh, these, there are some meta studies finding that, that uh, the similar elasticity of profitability relative to the corporate tax rate gap that ranges between minus 1.3 to minus 0 0.8. What does that mean? That means that when the corporate tax rate gap increases by one percentage point, then the profitability is expected to go down by more or less at 1%. And it is found that less developed countries, they are more exposed to, to profit shifting. There are not that many countries uh, or that many studies that have uh, looked at this because of lack of, of data. But the ones that are there, they actually find that, uh, that, that the lower the income of the country, the more exposed the country is to profit shifting. A lot of this profit shifting is uh, accounted for by, by firms trying to get to zero. So what is called zero profit firms. So basically, it's uh, when you take these zero profit firms out, then it's hard to find any evidence of, of profit shifting. And this in line with high fixed cost of setting up a tax optimizing scheme, then profit shifting is also concentrated among a few large MEs. So in Davies and co-authors example, when they took out the 10, um, the 10 largest, largest uh, companies, I think it was the 10 largest companies, uh, they couldn't find any evidence of profit shifting anymore. Another study from South Africa, on the other hand, shows that transfer mispricing is of similar magnitude in South Africa. So transfer mispricing is just one way of, of switching profits, uh, whereas debt shifting is more pronounced in developing countries. So again, there are not that many studies here because due to a lack of, of data available. There are also a lot of other ways to measure illicit financial flows. Uh, one is uh, performed by Anderson and his co-authors, uh, looking into what happens when a country experiences a windfall gain in either oil or in uh, aid disbursements. And what they find is that when, when these gains, they materialize, then you see an outflow of money to tax havens. So that is both when the oil industry experiencing windfalls, but also when, I think in this case, it was World Bank aid projects when they are announced. It's also found that tax haven secrecy services, they are of high value to firms by looking into what happened when, um, when the Panama paper they leaked. Then some, some companies, they were associated to the individuals that was named in the leaks and the value of those companies decreased relative to other companies that were not associated with the Panama leaks. Also using the Panama leaks, um, Bandonio Velias and Avilia Machecha, they look into what happened after a wealth tax reform took place in, in Colombia, and they could see that at the same time of the implementation of that reform, money were, outflow, were flowing out to tax havens. Then there are also a bunch of other studies that are related to, uh, to uh, anti-illicit financial flow legislation. Um, and 
the, the problem with these studies is that they are almost entirely based on high income country data. So there are not that many studies out there that are looking into, um, into uh, the effects of anti-illicit financial flow legislation in developing countries. So a few suggestions for future work. Um, we should look into the indirect and the direct evidence of profit shifting in the global south. Right now, the evidence is mostly based on, uh, on high income countries. Further, as and also related to that, is the question on how we most efficiently tax multinational enterprises. Then we should also have a look at anti-illicit financial flows legislation and information exchange treaties in the Global South. As I, as I mentioned on the previous slide, there are not any um, very, very few studies of uh, anti-IFF legislation from developing countries. It is also very, um, it would be very good if there were more uh, studies on the effects of improving capacity of tax authorities. There are also sessions here uh, at this conference looking into this, uh, this problem. Uh, and in particular, evaluating different types of, of technical assistance and what, what matters the most. Um, yeah, and then there are some more technical uh, questions here. So we should advance on the precision of shipping and insurance costs in order to improve the validity of, uh, of the trade misinvoicing methodology, because there are some issues with this, with this methodology. There are already studies looking into this, trying to improve on it. Uh, but these are, are still in the process, in, the, in progress. Um, yeah, then I have an, another um, technical uh, suggestion here, because the meta-analysis that I mentioned on profit shifting, they are based on pretty much just taking all, all the studies that were, that were made without any um, scrutinization of, of, of the included studies. So it would be, it would be uh, beneficial to have another meta study where, where the authors more, more, what can you say, where they scrutinize these studies more carefully and only include the ones that are, that are very, uh, that, are, that can be seen as, as solid evidence. Uh, because in, in some of these studies that they include, they found semi elasticities of minus five and some were also positive. And, some of them just didn't make sense. So if, if they are uh, affecting the, the, the results, then we should be careful with them. All right, I don't want to go through the conclusion because I already went through and Finn also stated to me that I have zero minutes left. So thank you all. Thank you.